Welcome to, uh, to this uh, great talk, uh, or this talk that we're going to talk about on DevSecOps, the tale of business, engineering, and people. And uh, you know, Sean put on some music there for us uh, that is, is going to be illustrative of the talk. I'm from Texas. I'm from Austin, Texas. And so he was like, well, let's play some country music. And I was like, I know just the song we need to play. So there we go. Uh, yeah, so uh, he introduced me, he said that I was the uh, dev advocate over at uh, Verica. Uh, I also have some LinkedIn learning uh, courses, uh, and I help run the uh, DevOps days uh, and uh, serverless days in Austin, Texas. And we're, we're about to have a DevSecOps days in Austin, Texas, and we'd love to have you come down there and check that out. I'm also working on the DevSecOps handbook, uh, and it's in progress right now. We'd love to have uh, some feedback, and I'll have a, a thing on at the end of the, the presentation about that. Well, uh, this is like one of my specialties. It's like maybe my favorite O'Reilly book. Um, and uh, and I, I, I find this is like, uh, this is, you know, I like it in depth, right? You're like, that's what I do. I'm on Slack all the time. So uh, if, if, that's, if you find that's you, uh, you can get the slides right now. Um, and, uh, and you can, by sending me an email at wicket at verica.io, my out of office autoresponder will have it in there and it'll have a link in there if you can download them if you like and uh, check it out. So, um, so if, you, if you suffer from me with that same syndrome, uh, then there you go. Well, uh, oh, and I'll have one slide in here to tell you what Verica is because we're a brand new startup and we're an enterprise platform for continuous verification uh, using chaos engineering principles to take a measured and proactive approach to preventing availability and security incidents. Um, so we're really excited about that. We're really excited about the process of, of where we're going, and maybe some of that will come out as we, we go through. But before we get started, and, and before we start talking about DevSecOps and we talk about anything, I thought we could like, talk about something uh, a little more historic, something that's been, that's, uh, that happened a long time ago. And I wanted to originally call this talk like a tale of money, chaos, and woe. But then, uh, then we kind of changed it up a little bit. But, uh, in the, day, in the year of 1896, almost to the day, um, this, this uh, coming Sunday is going to be the anniversary, uh, there, was, uh, there was this man who uh, came up with this idea that they were going to ram these two trains together uh, uh, as, a, as a demolition uh, experience. So this is uh, William Crush. William Crush is a uh, ticket agent for the uh, Missouri-Kansas-Texas uh, Railway, uh, often referred to the Katy uh, back in the day. And, and William Crush was just a, a passenger agent, and, uh, and, and they, the, the Katy knew that they wanted to expand their, their influence and their, uh, their reach across the state of Texas, and they needed some promotion to do that. And Crush had kind of been watching the newspapers, he'd seen some other things going on uh, in, the, in the world, uh, and, and that, was, that was interesting. He saw these other people trying to run, run trains together, and he knew that they had some spare engines laying around that they were gonna be retired, so he thought, he thought, well, why don't we, uh, why don't we get those? Um, and, uh, and for this promotional purpose, like we're gonna, we're gonna jam these uh, trains together. So it's gonna be like a demolition derby, uh, but for trains. And this was not, you know, like I said, it's not, wasn't the first time that, that uh, anybody had come up with this idea, but this is the first time that I think that we saw it be successful, sort of, in a way. But it, the idea was, uh, happened in, in Ohio several times, uh, but they struggled with the idea because uh, they, they would like try to charge tickets, but like you're, you're ramming two trains together, so you really have to block off a big area. Uh, and so people were like climbing up in trees to watch it. And sometimes they wouldn't even end up ramming the trains together because the, the financiers are like, okay, we don't have enough ticket sales for this. So Crush's innovation in the whole thing was the freemium model. He's like, we're just gonna make the whole, the whole thing free. If you, uh, if you, if you wanna come and watch these trains, uh, you know, just come on down. We got a spot for you. Texas has got a, land, a lot of land. He found, found a place with some good hills around it that the, all the crowds could gather uh, the, with a big kind of a natural, um, almost like a natural uh, place to see this. And they, they ran the, the trains line through there. So, uh, so overnight, he, so the, the railway loved it. Like the Katie's like, all right, like you're gonna jam some trains together. Uh, this is gonna be a big, big promotional event. Uh, they booked it like four or five months out. They started, uh, started working on it. Oh, and the, the kicker here was, uh, you know, he goes from, from this uh, passenger agent to like big tent promoter extraordinaire. And he, uh, he they, they said, well, this is a great idea. We're just gonna name the town right after you. So they called, they called it uh, Crush Texas. And it was a uh, city for a day, all of one day. And they sold these tickets, uh, tickets from, from Dallas uh, to Crush, Texas. Now Crush is, uh, it was located right in, outside of West Texas, which it sounds like a direction, but West Texas is actually a town. And it's uh, in between Austin and uh, Dallas, if you're thinking about that. 
So the idea was we're not going to make money on the actual event. We're going to make money on all the ticket sales. And so they sold a lot of tickets. Um, they sold so many tickets that it was the largest uh, exhibition in the state of Texas that, that had ever happened. Um, and 40,000 people, the estimates range from 30 to 50,000, but uh, a lot of people think it was around 40,000 people, came to Crush Texas uh, to watch this whole thing go down. So Crush, you know, put on his put on his hat and he said, "All right, well, what are we going to do to make this happen?" I, you know, it's going to be kind of rowdy. I mean, forty thousand people even today, like that's like RSA sized event, right? So like that's a big event. So we're going to need some uh, police officers, and they built a makeshift jail. Uh, they drilled a bunch of water wells uh, to to help make sure no one uh, no one got uh, you know dehydrated or anything. Brought in water tankers from outside. Brought in some concessions, some lemonade stands from Dallas. I think 10 of those uh, were brought in uh, from, from a guy up there. Uh, preachers and politicians descended on there. There was a midway that had games, uh, cigars, there was a carnival, all sorts of things. Big festival, festivity. So uh, on the business model didn't stop there. So he had, he had the ticket revenue, he had the concession revenue, and then now he added advertising revenue. These are the two trains that he was going to jam together. He, he, uh, the, and you can see over there on the far, uh, far right-hand side, there's some advertisements uh, on those. We can't see it too clearly. Um, but he, he started selling uh, banner ads, you know, if we were to think about it in, in our uh, parlance, right? And Crush was concerned about safety. He, he understood, like, this is, uh, this is a thing where people could get hurt, not just from getting dehydrated and standing out there watching these trains get jammed together, but, uh, you know, boilers explode. This is a shot of a, of a train engine in the uh, 1850s where just the boiler uh, exploded. And at that point, you may be thinking, well, what's, you know, what's going on here? Uh, this is a, all the pipes kind of running vertically. They kind of convey all the steam. That steam gets turned in, uh, to power to, to push the wheels. And this would just happen sometimes, like you're just driving down the, down the uh, you know, on your, your way and you hear some clunk clunks and then all of a sudden the, the train uh, explodes and now you're, in, now you're in a kind of a dire situation. So it's not like the idea of boilers exploding were uh, novel or new, like Crush knew to think about that. So we had engineers uh, come and look at the boilers and they said, yeah, these look good. He uh, laid four miles of track because he also didn't want like the uh, catastrophe to spread outside of the two engines. He didn't want it to take down the train, the, the train tracks. He wanted to be able to still uh, uh, have service to and from the event. So they laid four miles of brand new track that they were going to run these trains together at. He kept the crowd back at 200 yards. He let the press come in a little closer at 100 yards to get uh, better photos. Um, and, and then word got out about this event. And so the, the, you know, he went to a big uh, promoting type, uh, type role. And Edison, uh, Thomas Edison wanted to film it. Um, he, and he had a kinetoscope. Uh, this is the, the device they used to display it. But they, uh, he took a kinetograph there, um, not Edison himself, but one of his, uh, um, one of his students, I think, or his, uh, uh, one of his employees. And so on, uh, on the 4th of, on, at 4 p.m. on September 15th in 1896, uh, the trains were released to uh, come together. One of the reporters that was on the scene, they said, the rumble of the two trains, faint and far off, uh, at first, uh, at, faint and far off at first, but growing nearer and more distinct with each fleeting second. It was like the gathering force of a cyclone. And they captured this image right before the, the trains, uh, you know, collided. And it's a, it's a pretty great image considering the technology of the day, right? And you, you see this. And so, and they, com they collided at a speed between 90 miles an hour and 120 miles an hour. The estimates are kind of range on that. And, uh, and it was a big explosion, really big. And, uh, but one second, right after that initial explosion, there was uh, a subsequent explosion. And both of the boilers and both engines uh, also exploded. And that was, we showed a picture of the boiler in like real life, but here it is, uh, a diagram of it. Um, and, and it was common for, like, if you got any uh, cracks on the, uh, uh, you know, along the walls or any of the welds, or if there's any rust inside. And so as I started researching this, I started kind of geeking out. I was like, well, how do boilers explode? Well, you know, how does, how does this all work, right? And so you, you kind of go down the process, but you see uh, uh, this is actually the, the boilers. This is not just the train, you know, uh, exploding. This is the, the boilers uh, uh, exploding and now propelling uh, all sorts of stratinol across uh, the sky. And uh, it was a, it's the steam and the iron and the wood just filled the sky and it started to rain down on all the crowds. 
Uh, of course, uh, they're Texans, so after the dust settled, they wanted to go get a souvenir. So then they, they, they rushed the, the scene of the accident, um, not to be held back. And then they also got burned uh, from that because it was still hot, you know? So injuries were sustained on all sides. And the, there, there's estimates about four people that died. Uh, other, other aftermath and fallout from this, uh, Crush was fired. Uh, widespread injuries uh, during the incident, then you know, more injuries after the incident, after everybody's trying to collect their, their souvenir. Um, uh, Crush Texas was immediately shut down. The Katy uh, lawyers and, and representatives were brought in and they, uh, they started to work out the settlements with everybody and get all the details done. Uh, this is a couple days later when they say, all right, we gotta pull up the tracks. And now when you go there, there's, there's nothing there. Like there's nothing in the, the field. And uh, we, we have the a sign, and I think, I think it was in the 80s. They, they had the sign out kind of in the middle of nowhere where the site actually was, uh, right out, out of the, outside of the I-35 in Texas. But then they ended up moving it into the town of West because like no one ever actually went out there. It's still just a big empty field. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what we've been left with. So, more fallout happened in the days, the days following. So uh, Crush uh, later uh, was rehired uh, by the Katy, and uh, he worked there for 44 more years. So the, the firing didn't stick because it turned out that no one really blamed him uh, for it, and it was just sort of a, more of a, a move, a political move to, to cover their, their bases there for the train. Uh, and, and after this happened, it was actually deemed as a success, oddly enough. Demolition Derby via trains started to become a national phenomenon. Um, hundreds of other cities, like you would think like, okay, cool, they're gonna say, hey guys, stop, stop doing that, like stop ramming trains together. But no, they, they decided like, no, we're gonna keep, keep this up. Uh, but in the events, the, uh, the hundred of events that happened post-crush, all the boilers held. So it's not like it was a, a crazy idea to do this in the first place. Like, the, you know, it's, it, it was possible to, to do this without having, um, mass chaos and death and, and all that. So, all right, in, in all this, what can we learn? What, what is it, uh, these are some things that I took away from it. First off, like, uh, we, we have uh, chronocentrism, which, you know, we think that our generation and our time, we're smarter, you know, because when I first started reading this and started going through this, I, I read about it, and I'm like, oh yeah, like, why, you know, why would you, why would you do this? Like, that's a bad idea. Uh, also, engineering is hard, right? We, we think that that uh, you know, they, they obviously got the engineering right to get the, the, the uh, crash to happen in the right spot where everybody could view it, the photographers could take the pictures, um, they could try to, try to video it for the first time, which it would have been, the, if, if uh, the video had survived, which it didn't um, from Edison, um, it would be the first like, special effect ever recorded. Also, blame is really easy. Like you can, you know, just fire somebody, or you can uh, uh, sort of, you know, use that as an option to to deal with the problems. But it's not really a fair a fair way to deal with it. And it also taught me like root causes a myth. Like who who is the main cause for this? Like was it was it Crush? Was it the uh, the people at, at the the Katie who approved the whole event? Was it the engineers who evaluated the uh, um, you know, the engines to say that they were safe to 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 do the crash, the, or, or was a part of society like wanting to see this kind of thing? Uh, it's hard to, hard to na analyze in this sort of situation uh, who, who really would do that, who, who is really at fault in that scenario. And it, when you're thinking of socioeconomic and, and uh, uh, socio-technical systems like that, that sort of overlays and overmaps to that. So uh, I also believe that like breaches and failures uh, or, or accidents or whatever, that doesn't stop business. And we saw that like they continued to keep on going and, and, uh, and have some progress uh, where, they, where they were able to have a lot more of these type of events later on uh, in the late 1800s and uh, be successful. And also the last thing I, I came away from this is that experimentation and learning are critical for us. Uh, and and if, you could, if they could have done some sort of smaller scale experiment, like that would have been a better, uh, better play there. Okay, cool. Well, um, yay trains, right? Okay. Yeah, well, uh, okay. I was hoping that would be funnier. Um, cool, so uh, uh, DevSecOps. Well, where does this all fit in with DevSecOps? And like, we have all these learnings. We can think about this event that happened, you know, 100 years ago, 123 years ago. But what does that really mean for us? What does that mean for us today? How do we think about this thing that we're left with that we're now dealing and talking about uh, called DevSecOps? And I, th I think that I'd like to, uh, in, the, in the words of my good friend, 
uh, Josh Zimmerman and his DevOps Deep Thoughts, I, I thought I'd like to, uh, to think about what DevSecOps means. Maybe in order to understand DevSecOps, we have to look at the word itself. Basically, it's made up of three separate words. Day, Viseco, and Psss. Well, what do those words mean? It's a mystery. And that's why so is DevSecOps. Uh, and so we're left with it, and we're thinking, why do we have this? What does this mean? Um, well, first, I think we could look at DevOps and understand how we got there, and that might inform us like, why we think DevSecOps is important and, and how we can live with it. So this is going to be a real special time for us. First, we had the cloud, and it was great, and we, we saw it and we loved it. And the data, it just got so big, and we were thinking, this is awesome. You know, now, uh, and now our new OSI model is really a lot easier to understand, which I am, this is my favorite part of it all because I was really always struggling before. And then we have this thing called serverless that came out that, that let us move our, our consumption and, and, and payment closer to what we're actually using. Tom Limoncelli says this, he says, DevOps is an inevitable result of needing to do efficient operations in a distributed computing and cloud environment. So when we have a single person managing 10 and hundreds of computers, it's fine. When you're doing thousands, not so fine. You need something different. But Damon Edwards always reminds us that DevOps is not a technical problem. DevOps is a business problem. I, I like to think of it as epistem an epistemological breakthrough where you join two, two disparate groups of people around a common problem. Uh, DevOps was needed to fix also the inequitable distribution of labor that we often experience, where you'd have 10 developers to one operation person. Uh, and I also think that you know, DevOps is just another waypoint. You could think of it this way, as it's just another waypoint on the journey of Agile across the business and, and to find uh, value. Well, okay, fine, maybe you're convinced, maybe not, but that's what, that's what DevOps is, but why do we need DevSecOps? Why is it important? And I asked myself the same question. I thought, ah, this is just gonna get out of control. Like, we're gonna be stuck with this, this uh, scenario and it's not gonna be great for us. But uh, a little bit of empathy also kicked in, like figuring that security itself, is finding itself, security is finding itself in the same position that operations did in the early movement of DevOps. So for every 100 developers, you'd have 10 operations to one security person. Uh, there's a natural stylization that happens whenever you do this. Uh, people are throwing things over the wall. And, uh, and security, like operations, really struggles to provide value in many organizations. Uh, this book, Steve Beloven, uh, that he wrote, it's called Thinking Security. And I, there's two, two quotes that I like, almost like to always use uh, in any presentation I give, and this is one of them. He says, companies are spending a great deal on security, but we read of massive computer-related attacks. Clearly, something is wrong, and the root of the problem is twofold. We're protecting the wrong things, and we're hurting productivity in the process. Does that bother anybody here? Does that, does that hit home? Yeah, right, it's like we're, we're not stopping the problem, the breaches continue to get worse, and we're slowing everything down. Like, and the, the business doesn't always see security as on their side. The other one that I like is Michael Zalewski's book, The Tangled Web. In it, in, uh, in the first chapter, uh, first ch second chapter, he walks through a history of computing and says, uh, and kind of goes through like in the early, in where security was in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, but in the 90s, we kind of hit this speed bump and we have this, this uh, quote. He says, security by risk assessment introduces a dangerous fallacy, that structured inadequacy is almost as good as adequacy, and that underfunded security efforts plus risk management are just about as good as properly funded security work. And I read this quote uh, many years ago, and it's always stuck with me as just a, like, we, we don't want to do that. Like, we actually want to do good engineering work. We don't we just want to just buy insurance policies or do actuarial duties to, to, to deal with our problems. Um, but that's what we're often left doing. Uh, last year, late last year, SANS came out with a report for the uh, DevSecOps survey and it said, engineering, while engineering teams are busily deploying leading edge technology, security teams are focused on fighting yesterday's battles. Does that hit home with anybody? I kind of, yeah, yeah. And, and that, that happens, right? And uh, I know people that go in on security engagements or, or, or just engagements uh, uh, for consulting, and they're like, oh, they're, they're talking Kubernetes. They're like, well, what do you do for security? They're like, yeah, we don't tell the security people about our Kubernetes deployment. They're like, why? It's like, because they'll get all up in our business, and like, we don't want that, right? And it's like, okay, that's a real problem. Um, 
And I think it's because one of the things we often feel with security is that many security teams work with this worldview where their goal is to inhibit change as much as possible. And it's kind of reasonable. I mean, we're, we're dealing with, uh, or, or it's, it's reasonable to see why we need this, right? We have new technology that's coming about. And we have an increased organization focus on, on software delivery. And I think that's why we really need DevSecOps. Like we're trying to produce at a faster speed and we have a lot more uh, uh, technology involved, and so we need something different. And so this is where I, I think that we need to think of this new breed, this, this, this person as the DevSecOps, and I'd like to talk like what I think the DevSecOps is, um, talk through um, a, a framework that I've worked on for that. But it's not a tool, it's not, uh, you can't buy it over in the expo hall, and I mean, I know some people would convince you otherwise, um, but you can't buy it over there. It's not a CI CD pipeline, uh, that maybe has some security tools, uh, you know, jammed in there, and uh, uh, you know, it, it is something that is that we become, and it's something that we are uh, that, that we are dealing with as we kind of wrestle with the idea of DevSecOps. And I, I like to say it's an inclusive person participating in the movement of security into DevOps. So I have this framework that I've been working on. It's uh, the, it's uh, the Measure framework, and we're going to uh, punch through uh, each of these and. Um, I don't want you to take this as like, you have to be doing all, all seven of these to be you know, fully like DevSecOps. Um, not, not even all of them will fit, but in the spirit of like John Willis, or John Willis and Damon Edwards when they came out with the CAMS model, which is the uh, culture automation measurement and sharing, and then later uh, CLAMS because they added lean in there. Um, I wanted to give us a way to think about how DevSecOps works, uh, how we can sort of rationalize it when we're dealing with the, in our business, uh, make, uh, make business cases for it, and, and put effort and engineering behind different areas uh, of, our, uh, of our software uh, delivery and, and development. So what does measure mean? It means maker-driven, experimenting, automating, safety-aware, unrestrained sharing, ruggedizing, and uh, empathy. All right, are you guys ready? Yeah. yeah, okay. Thought that'd be more exciting, so we'll see. We'll just. It's good, you know, it's the afternoon and, and all that stuff, and I already gave you the slides, so you're like, I know where you're going with this, so. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, so maker-driven. Let's, let's kind of punch through a few things on this. All right, so first, we're software engineers who specialize in a specific discipline, security. Uh, that means one thing. That means that security must be able to write code. And I've said this before uh, at a conference, and uh, then I got like a lot of hate messages on Twitter about it. Um, and in the end, I sort of, I, and so if you're, if you're hoping to, uh, to do that, like, that's great. Take a picture of it, put it on Twitter, say Wicked says security must be able to write code, and I'll be dealing with that for like months to come. Appreciate it, thanks. Um, but we could really think about what it really means. Like, you're in the process of delivering software. You're in, you're, 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 you're in the world of software, and you don't know how to actually like, create software to be a part of the process of, of writing software. Like, that should be concerning. Like, security should know how to be a part of this. Operations had to do the same thing. Operations used to say, well, I just run the Nginx server, and I don't deal with any of the other problems, or I just run the, you know, the Tomcat, or whatever. But um, all that stuff had to break down. I'm not saying security needs to lead the process. I'm not saying, like, security's main job is to write code. But be being part of the software delivery process, uh, that's really important. And I, I don't know why this is a hot take in our industry, but it seems to be and uh, we'll see. And maybe in five years, uh, I'll be wrong, but I think that in five years, uh, I won't be. Uh, if you try to get a job at like one of those like, uh, startups, or, or not only startups, like any, any security job right now that's like DevSecOps, like they're gonna expect you to write code, right? I mean, that seems pretty, pretty reasonable. And uh, there's a lot of resources available today. Uh, these are my two favorite books on, on writing code uh, that, were, that uh, I don't leave these, uh, keep these on the, right on the desk, so. In the end, like we have to think about that, we have to internalize this as like security is part of making. Like we're a part of the building of the stuff, um, and we're already we're already somewhat developers. Uh, operations was like, yeah, you know, I, I do I already kind of know a lot of YAML. Well, I guess there's other stuff back then, but um, I'm, I'm dealing with all this kind of code-like stuff, and security is already using those those DSLs as well. Like we're dealing with like writing those WAF regex rules by trial and error. Okay. Um, you haven't been, you haven't lived that, or you're like, oh, I don't want to live that anymore. Um, 
So, uh, but but the, the, the part is, the, the point is, is that the security team has to participate in, in the software delivery process. Uh, this is also uh, an empathy building exercise because it provides you familiarity with the tools and you're able to move up and down the pipeline, you're able to shift left and shift right and all that, all that sort of stuff, but you're able to participate in that process. Uh, another thing that I'll say is, as part of uh, being, being maker-driven is that to realize that a bug is a bug is a bug. Like to internalize that and understand that um, when we think about security uh, bugs, they're just regular bugs that can be exploited. And uh, I know uh, DJ uh, Schleen has a lot of uh, comments right now on defect density, and I'm not even going to talk about the, Im the importance uh, of it or, or how maybe it's a misleading metric or any of that sort of stuff. But I, will think, I do want you to think about this. All computer science papers that, that kind of talk about defect density or errors per lines of code and all that sort of stuff, the studies range from like half to 10 per thousand line of code. The important part is that defect density is never zero. Defect density is never zero. And now whenever I'm um, dealing with like all my framework and my dependencies and all the stuff that it gets bundled into my software, the 500 lines of code or 1,000 lines of code that I write can easily turn into you know, 400,000 lines of code, 500,000 lines of code. Um, OK, so uh, my hot take on all that is that we, we just can't train developers. We can't just say, well, we're just going to put you through the annual, the annual training and like, you're going to be you know, good to go. You know, how, good luck with that. And it, we, can't train human, we can't train developers to write secure code not because um, developers are stupid or not because um, the, you know, the training doesn't exist or we didn't buy the right product. It's because you can't teach humans to write code that doesn't have errors. We've been trying to for a long time and there's, there's no way to do it. So instead, I think we should focus on the ways that developers use to deliver code that is like less error prone uh, and more resilient to faults. Uh, so they do test-driven development, behavior-driven development. Um, they put meaningful comments in their commits or in the, in the code. Um, they think of like code smells and patterns and refactoring and instrumentation and observability. And they, they, work, with a, they, they work in ways that, that security could easily fit our tooling and our processes into that, right? Okay, so where are we, where are we left with this? The Agile Application Security Book says the goal should be to come up with a set of tests, an automated test that probe and check security configurations and runtime system behavior for security features that will execute every time the system is built and every time it is deployed. So, um, all right, that's, that's, that's how we can think about it. Uh, my last point on this, this measure piece is that security is inherently connected with quality. Uh, the DevSecOps community survey in 2019 uh, found that one in four developers believe that security is synonymous with quality, and we think that's going to continue to grow over time. Like that is one of those things that people believe about their software, and they want to have uh, high quality software. So being maker driven so it means to see security as part of engineering. Uh, view quality as a way to bring security in, and use code and not vendors to solve problems. Uh, don't tell people in the expo hall that I said that last bit. Okay, so exper uh, experimenting uh, and, and how we can learn from our experiments. So what are some benefits that we can have from, from doing experiments? Uh, they can be measured and repeatable. Uh, we, we get results based on our needs. We have actual outcomes. And, and we can look at, uh, I like uh, Aaron's quote. Uh, I work with Aaron, Aaron Reinhardt. He says this, uh, security incidents are not effective measures of detection because at that point uh, it's already too late. So what if you're able to sort of do some experimentation and learn like what are some common uh, causes or common problems you have? Uh, Shannon Leitz and I gave this presentation at uh, RSA uh, in 2019 and some research uh, that she did was taking the OWASP top 10 and moving this across, uh, that's the, the blue dots there, and then breaking it down into attack, uh, attack vector, or attack uh, types of attackers and uh, it's split up there with, uh, with scanners, uh, paid noise, uh, and then advanced adversaries being different colors. The point is uh, that and you kind of got to watch the whole talk, and, and it's a, it, she really uh, is able to uh, build all that out for you. But what your ex system actually experiences is different from what we, what we predict with the OWASP top 10. And it's different by your vertical, by your, your company business unit. Um, so th that's something that's worth thinking and, uh, about and understanding what am I actually being attacked with. Uh, okay, so and so yeah, so know uh, the know the most likely attacks and how to measure abuse and misuse. 
Uh, Zane Lackey uh, over at Signal Sciences, he says, we can't seed home field advantage. Uh, and I like that, because a lot of times in security we say, well, you can't, you can't make a perfectly secure system. It's like, well, maybe not, but I know my system better than anybody else, or I, I at least could, way better than the attackers could. So uh, why can't I uh, actually understand it a little more further? So, but experimenting necessitates that we understand our steady state. Uh, so I, I think there's a couple resources for you. Uh, any of the stuff that uh, Shannon Leitz does, uh, her Twitter handle is DevSecOps, and there's a talk which uh, is very similar to that slide that I showed for uh, 2019 RSA uh, that's uh, hooked in there as well. So, all right, uh, A, automation. All right, uh, this is the, the, uh, the piece that I think is pretty interesting to a lot of us. This is what we think about when we start thinking about uh, DevSecOps. We think about the pipeline. This also comes from that, from that DevSecOps survey. But you can break it up, uh, all the phases of the pipeline, and you can see the, uh, those without a DevOps practice, those are the kind of the orangey-looking uh, red color on there for you. And those are, those are much lower than people that have implemented uh, application security practices, which is, then they are like, they're kind of called the DevOps elite, and they're like that purpley blue color. But I was really just encouraged across the way, like all, all, a lot of the phases of the pipeline, people are implementing security tooling and security testing. Now, if you attended Derek's talk, you could see that like survey data versus like reality and code may not be as, as, as great as, great as uh, you think, so you might want to hit him up for some uh, uh, things on the slides for, for, that, for that talk. But I also thought it was cool, like, uh, web application firewalls, container application security, open source governance, static application analysis, dynamic application analysis. These are tools that we've had for most of them for a fairly long amount of time. And we see that uh, those with DevOps elite practices far and away um, have them installed uh, across and larger usage across our organization. All right, so uh, also with automating is we can think about how, how much we deliver. Uh, how, how, often we, uh, how often we deliver, how security uh, plays in, inside of that. Jez Humble in his book, uh, Continuous Delivery, says, continuous delivery is how little you can deploy at any one time. I often think about this as cycle time, uh, and we, like to, we need to optimize for, for total cycle time, and that means from time of code commit to like running in production. You want that to be a, as small as possible. Uh, a lot of people will recommend like the coffee test. So if, uh, it's like if it takes longer than five minutes to go from code commit to running in production, you might need a refactor. Um, you need to include your security tests in that as well. Uh, there was a great talk uh, yesterday uh, about the, on the pipeline and how to how to do that and like how you can fork out like long running jobs and things like that. But uh, whenever I was over at Signal Sciences, uh, we did 15,000 deploys in three and a half years. And, and you know, fairly small team, fairly small startup, uh, but we were moving uh, quite rapidly. It's because we, we constantly were always optimizing for, for total cycle time. We would have meetings where we'd come in and be like, all right, here's the build, it's like six minutes today, like how can we get this to go faster? And so everybody would have to like, you know, count off for like what they're doing and, and we would look at the security tests along with everything else. And it wasn't the answer to drop them. It was like maybe uh, run them in a different cadence, uh, run them in a non-blocking mode, um, maybe move them to the deployment system, which we did, did as well. But putting security in the pipeline, uh, you, know, you, can, you can start kind of small, right? You can do, uh, I mean, I guess SCA is not that small, but you can put language linters, you can do some like GitHound stuff, uh, putting some scanners in there, using Gauntlet, putting monitoring and telemetry in there. Uh, those are some ideas for you. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of great talks at this conference already about how to do a lot of that stuff. But we're, now we're able to treat deploys uh, as standard routine changes that have been pre-approved by management and they don't require this heavyweight change approval board or anything like that. So that's really refreshing and that means like security can now like unlock that whole like going fast part, right? Maybe we're not, maybe we may or may not be like stopping all the breaches but at least we can unblock the business um, and hopefully we will like bring down some of the, uh, some of the breaches as well. So I, I have two courses that I've written on this topic. Uh, one is DevSecOps, uh, Building a Secure Continuous Delivery Pipeline over on LinkedIn Learning. And the other one is an automated security testing, which is more of a deep dive into the, the actual code side. But if you're interested in those, uh, go check it out or hit me up. I, I might be able to get you like free access to it. All right, uh, all right the, the next one here, S, safety aware. Do we understand like the difference between simple and complex systems? A lot of times we, our, our human brains will often try to take a complex system and we try to make it, make it, uh, make it a simple system. But when we say simple, we mean they're linear in nature, uh, they're, they're easy to predict, 
uh, and, and something that we're able to comp uh, comprehend in our head. Like it's something we're able to uh, keep our mental you know, model, if you will, and understand. But complex systems, um, they are nonlinear in nature. Uh, they suffer from what's, uh, what can be called like the bullwhip effect. So a small change at one end of the whip uh, creates you know, uh, uh, sound, uh, sound, breaking, uh, sound barrier breaking uh, at the other end, right? So, so completely different results can happen out of the system. They're unpredictable, unpredictable in nature, and uh, there's no uh, mental model available for them. So with all this, like we, we like to abstract complexity away. And this is something we do uh, you know, in code and frameworks and other things like that. But uh, we do it with, uh, we try to you know, think of human beings like we have a mental model or the way we deal with other people. We do this with society, uh, psychological issues. Uh, we do it uh, because we can't handle all the cognitive load of keeping it all straight in our head at any one time. And so, uh, and, and we deal with that same problem through software and we just add another layer of abstraction, right? Like that's always the, the, the quickest way to solve a problem. It's like, I bet some YAML might fix that. I thought that one would be funnier. So good, we're two for two. Uh, great. Uh, uh, you, maybe I haven't been burned enough by YAML, I don't know. Uh, uh, but so, as we think about complex systems, then we now have to think, if we don't actually understand the system in, in any sort of real way, why is it, do we think that we can arrive at a root cause in a failure type mode? And so I think uh, root cause, uh, specifically in a complex system, uh, is a myth. Because we lack the full picture, uh, complex systems aren't linear, um, this is part of our blame culture that we, that we live in. You can think about our example with, with William Crush, right? It's like, and you're fired. It's like, well, you know, at first blush, like that seemed like a good idea. But later it's like, well, I mean, you know, all the steps were taken, uh, you know, who, maybe somebody else should have been fired, right? Uh, it, it also lacks uh, the context and forgets the organizational decisions around the, the, uh, whole, uh, the whole event as it happens. Um, and it really puts a focus on the specific, you know, the two trains crashing into each other, the explosion, rather than the, the whole situation and kind of lead up to the whole event and how it all unfolded uh, together, right? And Sidney Decker has a great book uh, called uh, Drift into Failure. And he has this quote, he says, drifting into failure is a gradual incremental decline into disaster, driven by environmental pressure, unruly technology and social processes that normalize growing risk. No organization is exempt from drifting into failure. Uh, we can think about the Boeing 737 MAX. We can think about how like, uh, you know, now we're, where we have this, the MCAS, um, it, it's, it commands the trim uh, so the pilots don't have to worry about it for like a larger airplane. Um, the thing is the MCAS is just software. Like the software was doing all this without the pilots like really being able to detect what was, do what was going on. And uh, they were being told, um, uh, you know, like the software was fighting the pilots uh, like silently and the, the pilots were having to deal with this, uh, all this uh, information in a context where they were told that everything is like a normal you know, Boeing 737. And, uh, it, it was, it, and it, uh, I don't know if you've ever researched this or seen any of these, the info on this, but like the, the, the crashes were happening at like, I don't know, three to five minutes before, after the planes take off, something like that. So you, you were putting your, these, your operators in a high-speed decision-making uh, environment, uh, in a very up-tempo environment where they have to figure out what's going on, and all of the software is telling them that everything is fine. And software is, is, is eating the world and is taking over uh, our, our systems, so we're, we're, uh, you know, our physical systems as well. So now we're living in this complex environment where uh, we're, we're dealing with this. And Sidney Decker's quote goes on to say, or he goes on to say something else about complexity. He says, the growth of complexity in society has gotten ahead of our understanding of how complex systems work and how they fail. So uh, it's kind of concerning, but uh, I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, oh, here, I'll pull down a serverless uh, app and I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. I can understand that. I get it. Like, where's my three-tier web app, right? It's like, like that, at least I could, like, put that in my brain and figure out, like, yeah, the blinky lights on the database are not good. Like, it's like things aren't working in your web app. You're like, I have no idea. And this was, uh, whenever I went and downloaded this, this is, like, an easy, you know, getting started guide of, like, you know, how to use uh, Lambda and stuff. It's like, okay, cool. Uh, I like what my friend Matt Stein says. He's like, it's becoming clear to me now. Software. Probably a mistake. Um, I don't know exactly what he's talking about, but I like to think he's talking about this. Um, 
So we're leaving uh, the operations and the security team, um, we're, keep, we're putting all this burden on them uh, to rationalize our system models and to keep all this in their heads. So uh, that, that is not good. Uh, and we have to think about our failures as a system problem uh, because we don't have enough safety margin. Uh, and that's a quote from Adrian Cockroft. Uh, and, and we have to also reckon with this, uh, with this fact that now we're dealing with, with systems that are complex, they're, they, can, they, they, they fail, it's just a part of their nature. And Sidney Decker says, failure is an inevitable byproduct of a complex system's normal functioning. Like it's an inescapable thing. So how does security fit in all this? Well, security can be part of the story of adding safety margin in. Uh, we can add telemetry and instrumentation in. We can participate in blameless retros, uh, blameless retrospectives or postmortems or, or however you think about that, uh, but specifically on the blameless side of things. And, uh, and I have some more stuff in the empathy section to talk about that later. But if you're interested in any of this, if like you're kind of peaked at like, okay, the safety stuff like sounds oddly familiar and oddly scary to the stuff that I deal with in security, um, here's, some, here's some links for you. I guess the, the text there may be hard to read, um, but uh, check these out. There is a, a human error video series that uh, Aaron Reinhardt turned me on to uh, by Sidney Decker that I think is like really great. Um, and then if you don't have any, if you only have time to do one thing or read one thing, at the very bottom there's Richard Cook's paper. It's uh, called How Complex Systems Fail. It's pretty short. Richard Cook is a medical doctor uh, and he, he wrote this, uh, this uh, this thing about how complex systems the human body failed, but when you read it as an IT person, you're like, holy smokes, like, that sounds exactly like the stuff that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, now uh, Richard Cook uh, goes around speaking on this, and, and he'll speak at a lot of IT conferences nowadays um, because of kind of so much overlap and, and so, much, uh, so much learning that we've gotten out of that. Okay, well, let's move along. So let's talk about unrestrained sharing. Uh, unrestrained sharing is, is something that may feel um, a little weird to security, but uh, Patrick Dubois, when he first founded DevOps and he first kicked it off, um, I think it was like 2011 or 2012, he did a uh, enterprise, like can, can DevOps work in the enterprise? And, and he did a whole, uh, uh, I think it was a Cutter IT journal uh, on this. But one, one of his quotes is that culture is the most important aspect to DevOps succeeding in the enterprise. And if you go back in time and you were like to ask anybody in DevOps, like, what is DevOps, especially in like 2010 or 2011, they would just say, it is a cultural movement, you know, stop, right? And then you're like, well, that's, <laughs> that's not going to do it. But they were so worried about like people taking DevOps and then equating that with some sort of software or tooling or job title or something like that. Eventually we did all those things because we're humans and that's what we do. And they, they you know, all of the uh, original DevOps uh, OGs were like, that's, that's gonna happen. So we, we don't wanna do that, but uh, it's, it's gone ahead and happened anyways. But um, I do still believe that we, we originally focused on culture uh, for the right reason. Uh, and we still need to continue to keep that as a, as a heartbeat for, for DevOps. And because DevSecOps is just an extension of DevOps, we need to think about that as we kind of move forward. Uh, Rich Smith, uh, he says, uh, former security director over at Etsy, he says, a security team who embraces openness about what it does and why spreads understanding. So unrestrained, uh, unrestrained sharing affects our culture. Uh, but it goes against a lot of our standard operation, operating procedures. Uh, a lot of times I think that you'll feel that it'll feel uncomfortable to you to share. Uh, but sharing uh, naturally breaks down silos. Uh, you know, if, like, if you, it's like, oh, only the security team is allowed to log into this one security tool. Like developers should never have, you know, information about this because, you know, cloak and dagger type stuff. Well, like, uh, that's probably wrong. Um, if you have a thinking like that, you need to try to come up with ways to uh, maybe sanitize some of the data or whatever, but you got to figure out ways to create sharing across those groups. Uh, four keys that I think are important for culture are uh, having a mutual understanding, having shared language, having shared views, putting collaborative tooling in place. Uh, and, and as those things kind of develop, you start building a uh, culture uh, that, that is really useful. I, I like the DevSecOps survey, because uh, one of the questions that uh, the, the, they were asking developers, like, hey, what do, what do you think about this, you know, security? Or, and, and they were trying to go back and forth on this, but one of the answers was, you know, we don't even really know what like, security wants from us. Like, we have no idea what they want us to do. And, uh, and it didn't matter if they were a DevOps practice or, a, or immature in their DevOps practice, they were just like, yeah, flat out, like, a fifth of them are just like confused. Like we, security has not brought them in uh, in the process. 
So I think security shares through making stuff, uh, the invisible stuff visible, adding security observability, uh, finding ways to put in APIs or webhooks or dev tooling or any of that sort of stuff. And you can't leave out the auditors, which is, I know it's really tempting to do. Sorry if there's any auditors in the room, but um, uh, I think it's important. There's a project that we started working on, uh, I guess about a year and a half, two years ago, called Dear Auditor, and it's over at dearauditor.org. And this is a love letter from DevOps to auditors. And in it, we, uh, we, we apologize, um, which uh, sometimes uh, uh, you, know, you have to do. And we said, hey, we, we started this whole DevOps thing, and we didn't bring the auditors around. Because uh, I don't know if you ever, anybody go through like an audit or compliance thing, and you're like, you start talking, and the auditor's like, mm -mm, I, that is not going to work. You know? And you're like, oh, we have a huge disconnect here. Um, so, so I've experienced that. And so we, we built this, and then also associated with this is a, a DevOps controls matrix. Uh, matrix. So if you want, it's open source. Check it out. We're uh, still working on it, still putting some stuff, uh, stuff together on this, but uh, yeah. Okay, some, some resources for unrestrained sharing. I think the Phoenix Project book, if you haven't read it, I know it's kind of uh, canon uh, now, but uh, definitely check that out. That book, the Agile Application Security book, has some, has some context on, on this as well. Uh, and then Dear Auditor, I think, is a, a great uh, resource, or I think it could be a great resource if we can kind of get more uh, work behind it. Okay, uh, let's talk ruggedization. What do we mean uh, about ruggedization? <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is running everywhere. Yeah. Um, so I think one thing, like the one way we build something that's rugged is by like knowing what we have, which is kind of a novel concept, right? So like we have our build materials and so we, we get to know what is inside of our, our software. Uh, another thing that you can think about for rugged uh, or ruggedization of software is that you know, we favor short-lived systems, uh, the old saying of cattle, not pets. Uh, although I've heard some people tell me they don't, they don't appreciate that and there's some other ways we could think about it, but I'm like, I don't know. But uh, Sunil Yu, uh, he has the, the DAI framework and he's working on a paper, and I'm not sure if it's out yet or not, but he's, uh, he's, it's, uh, it's proving that just by having these three attributes in your system, you're, you're by, by the very nature, mathematically more secure. So if it's distributed, immutable, and ephemeral, uh, if you have those three things in, uh, in any combination, um, you are, you're gonna be more secure. So it's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool research and uh, really interesting. So as that comes out, or kind of be looking for it as you can find it. Uh, but where is ruggedization going? Like we can, we can talk about other, other type of stuff, but I think there's two key areas uh, where I believe ruggedization is happening and where we're gonna see this grow over the next year. Uh, first, I think deception. Uh, this is, you know, this, we ha I know we had like all the honeypots and all that stuff like 10 years ago, and, but I see people really like industry leading firms uh, that, are, that are working on doing deception tactics that are uh, making a huge difference. Uh, they're putting honey pits and tar pits and man traps and all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's simple to get started. You can like just, you know, put, you know, spoof out some, uh, um, uh, you know, some hidden HTTP fields or something like that and, and see if those get called and then you can flag it. Uh, some good projects on this. Honey Pie is an open source one. Uh, Deception Logic is uh, a friend of mine's company is trying to get off the ground, so it's kind of cool. But, but thinking through like how do we build better deception into our systems as ways we can get security telemetry and instrumentation uh, out and to the developers and we can sort of uh, uh, play that out. So the other piece I think is also chaos engineering, which is somewhat where we've kind of started with this whole talk and, and we've uh, talked about where that sort of fits in. But we're moving from this disaster recovery uh, belief system to now we're moving into chaos engineering and then overall like we're trying to build overall resiliency and Adrian Cockcroft uh, has a great quote on that. Michael Nygaard, so if you, if you need a primer to chaos engineering and you're like you can't wait until the the new O'Reilly book comes out uh, in a few months, uh, there's, a, there's a great book called uh, Release It, but you have to get the second edition if you want to if you want to check it out because he added the chaos engineering in the second edition, but uh, it's by uh, Michael Nygaard. He has this quote, he says, uh, chaos engineering is empirical rather than formal. We don't use models to understand what the system should do. We run experiments and then we learn what it does. Uh, Aaron Reinhardt, uh, uh, my buddy says, the uh, security discipline of chaos experimentation is done in order to build confidence in the system's ability to defend against malicious conditions. 
Uh, and so that's what, that's what chaos engineering is trying to do. We're trying to experiment. Um, we're trying to uh, run, run these uh, experiments that span both engineering and security. Uh, a lot of places will put it into like a manual opt-out type uh, scenario. But you, you, you make valuable learning and like it's all about the learning. You're not trying to just blow stuff up and break stuff in production, which you know, some of the marketing material will come out on that. But what we're really trying to do is figure out uh, our system operates like this today. And we get a, a more clear picture of that. And we, we build these experiments that are controlled, they have a controlled blast radius, and it helps prove out like if our mental model and our understanding of the system is true today, and then like whenever that experiment gets run again later, is it still true? Uh, here's some resources on this. Uh, there's uh, Aaron's talk at RSA, there's the Principles of Chaos, there's the Release It book, uh, and then uh, Philip Maddox and Herb Todd both have great talks on deception, so feel free to check those out if you can. It's like you're like, I didn't know I was gonna get all this homework. So, uh, but uh, you know, I, I find that uh, is good. So, oh, let's go back to the well here. All right, so <clears throat> when I think of all the arguments the CISO and I have had, I realize how silly most of them were. And it makes me wonder why he wanted to argue over such stupid things. I think I'll go ask him. <laughs> this is a problem in our industry. Uh, oh, did you want a picture of that? You could. See that? Okay. Uh, this is a problem in our industry, uh, where we're 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 kind of like always at war and, and uh, against each other. Uh, and, and who's ever had this situation uh, where maybe not you because you're you know right mind you're at an, you're at uh, uh, Global AppSec DC so you're a right minded individual. But who says oh those stupid developers? Anybody has a friend that ever says that? Yeah. Okay. Um, Nobody wants to admit it. It's okay if you've said it too, it happens, right? Um, but sometimes we'll say like those stupid developers just in a real cavalier type manner. And then uh, I've had developers tell me, they're like, oh, you security people, you just want us to power off the machine and unplug them and just like, you know, like, and, and I'm like, wow, so you think that I don't understand where my paychecks come from? Because I, I know if we did that long enough, like we would never know, you know, this, the business, you know, ends, right? But, the, but developers see security as so disconnected from the running of the business so like the only way they're going to be happy is if just you know you have you know uh, a complete uh, you know nihilism here, right? So, uh, well, uh, half the developers say that they don't have time to spend on security, and and that's something that they, they deal with. The, the, we've looked at this from uh, 2017, 2018, 2019. The DevSecOps report is always reporting like 50% or 48% there in the background. But developers want to do security. They just you know find that they often don't have time. And so one of the ways that as a security person uh, we can be helpful, uh, especially in the AppSec world, is like, hey, let's not be blockers, but let's be enablers. Let's uh, help you know, kind of do all these other things in the measure framework to help us uh, make that happen. Okay, well, I'm gonna kind of wind down here. This is the, uh, the measure framework again, and we've kind of gone through that. And if you have any, so one of the things we're doing is we're collecting stories about uh, DevSecOps movements or, or transformations or failures at uh, organizations, and we're working on a book uh, uh, for the same uh, publisher as the DevOps Handbook uh, over with Gene Kim. But you can share your story with us, uh, book at devsecops.org, and we'd be happy to interview you, kind of write up a case study. Uh, if you need us to do it anonymously, I guess we could. Um, but, we, but we learn, like I said, it doesn't have to be a, a pure success. It could be like, yeah, we tried it and then like it didn't work. Like that's still really, really valid information for us. So if you have any, uh, if you want to get the slides, you can send me an email at, at uh, wicket at or if you have any questions, uh, you can hit, hit me at, to, uh, at wicket. But um, now, you know, we're kind of towards the end of the conference, and we have a little bit of break, and I asked Sean about this earlier. Um, with, uh, I know like Matt Tassaro's here, Aaron Reinhardt's here, uh, DJ Schleen's here, so we thought maybe we could have a uh, DevSecOps support group uh, uh, down here at the front. So um, if you have any like, questions or you, you need anything like you ask me ask these these guys they've done it at like uh, you know large large enterprises they've they've put together uh, pipelines at, at different places so uh, we'd be happy to come talk about it we're gonna be hanging around by the front uh, for a little bit but uh, but I appreciate your time and thanks and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference